The Honorable Justices of the Supreme Court of the State of Iowa. Hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable Supreme Court of the State of Iowa is now in session. Thank you. Please be seated. Good afternoon. Three cases will be submitted. Those cases are First American Bank and CJ Land versus Fobian Farms and others. Second case is Iowa Supreme Court Attorney Disciplinary Board versus Kenneth Smith. And the final case is Iowa Attorney Disciplinary Board uh, versus Jason Springer. The last two cases are now submitted to the court without oral argument and will proceed to hear the arguments in the first American bank case. Mr. Gertis. Good afternoon, your honors, and may it please the court, Mr. Roberts. My name is uh, Greg Gertis. I represent uh, the defendants in this uh, matter. For ease of reference, I'll refer to them as Phobian, although there are multiple defendants. Uh, my clients were the defendants and ended up losing in a reformation case which was brought against them in a, uh, as, as the aftermath of a very complicated real estate transaction. In addition, they were sanctioned for the full amount of the plaintiff's legal expenses and uh, collection costs, which were approximately $140,000. There are a number of record facts that I want to call to your attention at the beginning of this argument because I think they reflect not only why we felt reformation was not appropriate, but which we also feel demonstrate why sanctions are not appropriate. First fact is that well, I mean, aren't we at the point where the law of the case is there going to be sanctions, but the issue is the amount? I, I, don't, I don't think that's the, the law of the case. I, I think that we certainly, uh, you certainly have the authority to look back over the entire case. And well, we denied further review. The Court of Appeals uh, t didn't as I recall, affirmed an award of sanctions, but sent it back to Judge Thornhill to do some more work. And as I understand the present appeal, it's did he do the right work or enough work or, or whatever? I think that's certainly part of it, but I don't believe that it's a, a fait accompli that, that sanctions uh, are required to be awarded in this matter. <coughs> um, the first you do agree, though, that you're not asking us, and it's too late to revisit the Reformation rulings. That I, that's that's done and over with. I think you you could revisit the re, the uh, Reformation issue. I think you've got the authority to to uh, review whatever you choose to review. I think that's inherent in your authority as 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 uh, the ultimate uh, d decider here. <coughs> The first uh, record fact is that my clients advanced the sum of approximately $1 million, which was secured by three mortgages on the subject real estate. Um, the first uh, advancement was secured by a second and third mortgage of approximately $400,000, and then my clients spent $525,000 to acquire the first mortgage on the property. Well, I'm just going to kind of cut back to it. I, I, I don't think we're going to relook at that, but if we are going to relook at that, aren't we really talking about a, a scrivener's error or a surveyor's error where they simply misidentified one lot versus another lot that easily could have been remedied uh, at the very outset by either having a deed or some other type of document prepared simply to correct what everyone believed to be the mistake? and except for your client apparently not agreeing to it and requiring them to file this action, uh, 
that wasn't accomplished without this litigation now over many, many years. I, I don't think that's an appropriate way to look at it at all. My client had advanced the sum of approximately- I'm not worried about advancing the sums. I'm talking about what, we're talking about two lots, one of them that they thought was west or south, I always get them confused, mm -hmm. but it wasn't west or south, it was actually the opposite. Everybody was going on that assumption, everyone believed that was the case, except for your client who knew earlier on that that was incorrect and allowed somebody to build the structure on the wrong lot, even though it could have been corrected years ago. That is not our version of what happened. Our version of what happened is that my client, Mr. Fobian, and Jerry Iman, at that time the developer, met at the site and had a discussion as to what was going to be conveyed. My client believed 100% consistent with the public records, consistent with the plat, that the north lot was going to be conveyed. My clients had the claim of right based upon the public record. That's what the whole reformation issue was about. And also, remember my client later bought the first mortgage for another $525,000. So he had a very valid reason to defend this action. He had over a million dollars at stake. Well, I, th I think the, the, the court has already ruled that wasn't the state of facts, and so I guess I'm gonna go along with what I believe to be the law of the case, which is, in fact, that the reformation did take place we do have the correct amount, and then the only thing really left was the encroachment of that building on uh, a small encroachment on another lot, which is what you litigated as well. I, th I think it's important that we recognize the issue of sanctions should, is, is required to be determined based upon objective facts at the time of the filing. And here we are three, four years later, but at the time of the filing, Carl Fobian defended the lawsuit because he had that much of a personal and corporate investment in the property. That's important because the view of the trial court was that his entire defense had no basis in fact and wasn't brought for a proper purpose. I think the fact that he was defending his collateral and that his collateral claim was consistent with the public records is reason itself to deny sanctions in this case. If um, you lose on that point and we're now looking at the size of the sanction, whether the sanction award was excessive, what amount uh, in your view is sufficient to deter a non-lawyer party? Um, especially when a technical issue like this is involved. I, I think that the Court of Appeals, and this is on page 23 of their opinion, they ruled that the counterclaim that Carl filed was the sanctionable conduct. And the, um, the bank and CJ Land have not given us their calculation of what the costs are associated with just that filing. I've gone back and my calculation was that it could not exceed $3,500 because it was dismissed so promptly on summary judgment. And then to answer your point directly, underneath the authorities, including Judge Justice Katie's Law Review article, the amount of sanctions cannot exceed the fees associated with responding to the improper conduct. And the rule say that? that yeah, the rule. 1.413 says that, right? Yeah, the, that. that right. It's so did Judge Thornhill follow the rule? No, no. Judge All right, well, explain how he didn't. Uh, the main thing that Judge Thornhill did is he took the view that the defendants from the very time that they filed an answer were acting for an improper purpose. 
That's why he felt and that's why he assessed the entire legal expenses against them. And that's contrary to the rule for two reasons. First, the general filing of an answer should not be subject to sanctions. And second, for, what, for the reasons we were discussing earlier, there was a legitimate reason to defend against this reformation claim. And I would point to the Kufer case in which this court itself said that reformation is always discretionary. Always discretionary. Does your client have the ability to pay the amount of the sanctions ordered, a net amount of 100? Well, I guess there's already an appeal bond, so how do we factor that in? Well, the fact that he can afford to pay the sanctions shouldn't be reason to sanction him. You know, I, I think we need to get back. But, it, but it's relevant to how much of, do you need to, what's the right amount to deter? Well, I think we, need, we start with the language of the, of the rule. And the rule is our cap is going to be the fees associated to dismissing or responding to the frivolous filing. So that's our cap. In this case, it's about $3,500. And now you're asking a layman, how, how much is it necessary to sanction a layman for bringing a tortious interference with business advantage claim, which he's never heard of, and which the Iowa court is somewhat inconsistent with the restatement on, and you know, a, a layman isn't even, even going to follow this discussion. So I think if you were to give a layman a sanction of $500, that itself would be prudent for, for a typical layman. I think better in these circumstances would be to sanction the attorney who would presumably have more of the ability to and that wasn't you, of course, but is that an option for us now? I don't know the answer to that question. I, I think as the Supreme Court, you can essentially do whatever it is you want to do. But, uh, but well, on, on that I note, I don't think that was ever asked for. Right. So here we have a we're reviewing a, a six figure sanction against non lawyers. Mm -hmm. uh, if we decide that's too much. Mm -hmm. Do we send it back for a third do-over, or do we come up with the amount we think is right? I would like you to come up with the amount that you think is, is appropriate, because if you don't do it that way, I think we'll have to see each other again. So, um, <coughs> I'd also like to... Uh, Let me interject one more time. Um, what's the significance of this quiet title action has a, has a fee-shifting provision, which at the time of the conduct had a cap of $40. Mm -hmm. Does that provide any comfort for your position? Well, I, th I think it does. Uh, and, I, uh, and I also think the legislature has later on changed that. And I think what that means is that at the time, the law was that... You, you, your, your cap is $40. Um, now, I know that there's a difference between $40 and $3,500, um, but for the quiet title portion of things, I think the limit was, was uh, $40. I don't think that applies to the reformation claim, but there, of course there's no statute which allows fees in a reformation claim other than the the sanctions clause. <coughs> Finally, I'd like to talk about what uh, the trial court latched on at remand, and that was the letter that Mr. Fobian wrote to you folks. I hope that we are not in the situation where a trial judge feels it appropriate to sanction a non-lawyer participant for expressing his opinion as to how the trial court and the judicial process works. 
you know, if ever there was a classic example of a frustrated American communicating to government officials, his view on the government officials' uh, process, this is it. It's not profane, it's not threatening, it's not saying that further litigation is going to be commenced or that the decision is going to be ignored that was made. It just expresses his frustration and disappointment at the process. And clearly we need to recognize that as Americans, we've got that right. Um, I'm down to 42 seconds, so I thank you for your attention. Mr. Gertis, thank you as well. Mr. Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Uh, may it please the court and counsel, I'm Mark Roberts. I'm here on behalf of CJ Land and First American Bank. I'd like to get an accurate look at the conduct that's actually being sanctioned here. If you, if you go back to the answer that was filed in this case, as it became clear at trial, there were a lot of facts that Mr. Fobian clearly knew at the time he filed his answer. He had signed a partial release to allow a restaurant to be built by my clients free and clear of his mortgage. Mr. Fobian had no interest in that restaurant. Mr. Fobian either watched that restaurant be built and he made- All right, and let's assume that it's a given that that answer was sanctionable. How do you get all of the fees for all the work you did up to and including the filing of the petition? It seems to me the rule does not allow that. I understand the argument that's made about what the rule says and it has to arise out of or be caused by the filing. Um, I think if you look at the particular, particular nature of a quiet title action, Mr. Fobian would like to say, I never made a claim, this is all about a defense. First of all, I think an answer can be sanctionable as well as, as a petition. Right, I understand that. But so then, then we're down to what fees were caused by and expenses were caused to you and your clients or yeah. you know, whatever by the answer. But how do you recover? Because I know the district court awarded all your fees, all, everything up until and including the filing of the petition. How do you get that? Okay. Um, in, in a quiet title action, by its very nature, you're talking about differing claims to a single piece of real estate. So Mr. Fobian can't say he is not asserting a claim to this real estate, although it only kind of came to fruition. What's sanctionable is not asserting a claim in an abstract sense. What's sanctionable is a piece of paper that you file with the district court. And they didn't file a piece of paper until they filed the answer. Everything before that is something else, right? I, I would agree that it's a stretch to award uh, uh, First American Bank and CJ Land, but for the argument I'm raising about the nature of the quiet title action, I believe having looked back on it recently, there's approximately $20,000 worth of time that has been um, included within our affidavit and our billing statements that uh, up to the date that Mr. Fobian filed the answer. But I truly believe that in this case, um, uh, the district court saw it correctly, that there were, um, Mr. Fobian had a scheme, he had a plan, and he didn't care who had to pay for it. He was perfectly assert facts that were not true or deny facts that he very well knew to be true in his answer to pursue it. Now, Mr. Fobian isn't Microsoft, but Mr. Fobian is a well-heeled farmer in Johnson County, and he was perfectly willing to engage in a pattern and practice of denying facts that he knew very well to be true in his answer and throughout the trial. And I think what uh, uh, Judge Thornhill saw based on his testimony and the testimony of his lawyer was he was willing to tell multiple untruths in further of this furtherance of this scheme to try to pressure others into kowtowing and paying him something for a restaurant that he well, didn't know. It sounds to me like you would agree, though, and basically concede that there may not be any basis under this, this rule that would allow you to be compensated for, let's say, the 20,000 figure that you, the 
I'll call it the pre-answer expenses that may be here, but doesn't the rule or even the Court of Appeals remand also contemplate maybe more of a laser focus then on further uh, pleadings and, and actions that are sanctionable? I think the way that uh, Judge Thornhill saw the remand issue to him was he was supposed to look at the reasonableness of the fee, and I think he correctly followed the law in determining the reasonableness of the fee and the minimum amount that was needed to deter uh, the, the future conduct. Now, perhaps he read the, uh, the ruling of the Court of Appeals more narrowly than you would have him, but I think he did it, and that's the law of the case. Is that more than we, uh, it, it, or even if you take the 20,000 off the 100,000 and we're at 80,000, is that more th than the minimum sufficient to deter a non-lawyer? I really don't think so, and I don't think this is a case that necessarily should be pushed off on the lawyer because the lawyer doesn't necessarily know what the underlying facts are when he's filing an answer or you know asserting an affirmative defense or what it is he has to rely on his client and it was clearly Mr. Phobian who was behind the notion that the statements that were in our petition that he was denying them regardless of what he knew to be true. I, I hear you saying that basically Mr. Phobian committed perjury. He did. So isn't you know do you punish someone with sanctions because they committed perjury isn't the sanction for perjury, uh, a criminal offense, if the county attorney or other person uh, so decides, judge refers it should be brought. I mean, you, 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 it seems to me that you're trying to punish this guy um, um, above and beyond what would be reasonable under the factors in Barn Hall and the ABA rule. I, I respectfully disagree with you, Your Honor, that we're attempting to punish him. And I, I don't believe that the, the sanctions that are awardable under 1.413 as an alternative to perjury, that it, the only punishment or the only uh, recourse against someone who's willing to uh, lie in an answer is to convince a county attorney to investigate the facts of a civil case, make a determination if they can prove beyond uh, a reasonable doubt and pursue perjury. I think that would make the job of, of attorneys and of the court much more difficult if that was the only recourse to for, for litigants who are faced with uh, pleadings that are rife with denials of facts or assertions of facts that are clearly untrue. You know, in Rowett, are the um, fees incurred defending the frivolous um, claims were over 60,000, yet our court affirmed a, a sanction set by the trial court of 1,000. And I think my dissent thought that was too low and thought 10,000 was more like it. Um, is, is that the ballpark we should be in? I, I don't think so. Looking back at Rowdy fairly recently, there was you know pretty good record there that the statements or arguments that made by counsel were made in in, in good faith based on what they knew at the time and there were other extenuating factors that made it um, advisable not to award the full amount of the fees incurred. I think this case is very different given the, the scheme of Mr. Phobian uh, to try to um, leverage what was clearly a mistake into a restaurant. Uh, apart from subtracting the 20000 incurred before the answer and counterclaim, were there other filings that um, should be segregated out as not caught, uh, because of the, the frivolous claim? I mean, didn't he win some relief? I think anything that was caused by other defendants in this action, for example, the, the condominium association, uh, they were a necessary party to this, but, but for Mr. Phobian sort of pushing the scheme, their answers were basically uh, denials for lack of information, as you might expect from a condominium association. I guess I view the, uh, the filings and what the court did below as an acknowledgement that any other fees associated with these other things were de minimis and they shouldn't be subtracted from the necessary amount to deter the conduct. Do you agree that the uh uh, proof of an inability to pay is was Phobian's burden. 
Yeah, clearly under the existing law, he bared the burden of proof with respect to his inability to pay, and he filed a, uh, a, a bank order, a cash bond, within 30 days of the entry of the final judgment. I think it's pretty clear Mr. Fobian and the Fobian defendants have the ability to pay. What about the, the letter? If we assume that letter was, was not something that should be um, given weight in, in awarding additional sanctions, is that a do-over, and, and should, is it fair game to consider? I think it's fair game to consider. Well, I thought it was fair game to consider. I'll tell you, I don't think that issue was preserved in this case. Um, it only came up on appeal um, after the, the, the ruling on remand. So what you'll find lacking in my brief and counsel's brief is any discussion of the sort of Nor Pennington concerns that I hear sort of being raised today about we've got someone who's making a, a First Amendment argument to this court. I mean, that stuff's not well briefed before you. I don't think it's preserved. But, the, but beyond that, I don't think we're talking about this. We're talking about existing litigation where I as a lawyer, my, me as a client, and my opponents are constrained by the rules of civil procedure. We're constrained by the rules of appellate procedure that there are only so many ways that we can address you with our grievances. And what he did was file a letter in this case that you had to respond to, and it delayed the issue of procedendo by three or four months. So it became a pleading in this case, and I think the court below was proper in considering that issue in, in deciding what it did, if it is in fact appropriately before this court because it's been preserved. But the encroachment issue, I mean, that was a legitimate issue. There were legitimate encroachment issues that this building was not built exactly on the, 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 the property. There was a dispute about whether Mr. Iman had the authority to expand that. Um, but I think the, the condominium associate, association, its pursuit of that was fairly de minimis, and Mr. Fobian didn't come up with many arguments about what the valuation of uh, the, the tiny strip of land he had. I guess I would say the encroachment issue, while it had to be resolved, could have and should have been resolved long before this matter was filed, but to the extent that it became a, an issue in the litigation, it was also kind of a, a de minimis dispute. The real dispute was this business about, you know, making up a basis to claim that someone owned a restaurant he never bought. It's there Council, I haven't looked at your time records, but if we were to conclude that um, the uh, fees in relation to that, litigating that encroachment issue, should not have been part of the sanction. Are your uh, uh, time records and filings adequate for us to figure out how much time you spent on that specific question? Um, I would hope that my firm's uh, time records are adequate for you to do that. I guess I can't represent that I've looked at that recently to tell the court I think it's, it's, it's going to be easy for, for you to do at this point. But if, if um, I would expect it would be possible. What's the significance of the of the real estate quiet title action fee shifting in the legislature's decision in this most recent session to lift the forty dollar cap and now provide a reasonable attorney fee award in a quiet title action? I think that argument is a, has not been preserved for appeal to this court. Whether um, the uh, forty dollar fee was um, was too, was too small, was an argument we made uh, to the district court, and the district court said, you know, obviously First American Bank and CJ Land recognizes that it's only $40 fee, so instead it's looking to 1.413. I think those are alternatives, and I, I think the argument that we are somehow limited by what's under the statute for a quiet title action to 40, 40 bucks, that's been abandoned on appeal as far as I can tell. What, what, a, what do you say to the, uh, to the view that um, a sizable sanction award will have a chilling effect on advocacy? 
I don't think it will have a chilling effect on advocacy that's, that's legitimate. I think it may have a chilling effect and an appropriate chilling effect on people who are willing to deny claims that they know aren't true and then to continue to persist them. Because he made these claims that he knew were untrue, they became fact issues. It wasn't something that was, could have been easily dealt with on summary judgment. It forced a, you know, a three-day trial to the, to the bench below. I think it would be appropriately chilling of lawyers or parties um, disregarding the facts they know to be true. Do you have a view on, on if we the full amount awarded of 140000 that the taxes uh, is too high, do we do it over ourselves or remand it for a, a third go around? I believe the, the court has the ability to decide the fee, and I guess I'm in agreement with, with Mr. Gertis that uh, I think that the parties would rather have a, a decision, but if it needs to go back, we can certainly provide the, the court uh, additional information in order to kind of ferret out the, what's de minimis or what was pre-filing based on your decision. Thank you. Mr. Roberts, thank you as well. Mr. Gertis may present your rebuttal. Frequently in negotiations, especially in business transactions and oral discussions, there are agreements and there are disagreements. Frequently, people walk away from discussions with totally different understandings of what was agreed to. Does that make one of them a liar or a perjurer? I think the answer is no. I think, especially in this case, when Mr. Fobian's version of events is corroborated with the public records, that it is a serious mistake to assume that someone who files an answer and whose version of events is found not to be true by the trial court is equivalent to a perjury. Trial courts are routinely faced with he said, she said, or other sorts of squaring matches that lead to losses. And the but here's the problem. I mean, it's kind of rich for your client to be making that argument. I mean, I'll say I'm not bothered by this letter. We get letters and I get phone calls, I get conversations, I'm in the phone book, I'm, I'm listed, someone wants to talk to me, come at me. But the whole tenor of the letter is kind of that the fix is in and the, you know, you just, money pay, runs its way in the legal system. And it's kind of troublesome to then be, you know, making that argument, well, this was all good faith when, you know, you have your client directly accusing the court system of bad faith in, in I, this I, letter. I don't think he's accusing the court system of bad faith. I think what he is frustrated at is the fact that public records, especially deed land records, can be changed through reformation. And they take away his collateral. That is something that he has a hard time understanding and accepting. Well, but again, the, the trial court, and you know th that is the law of the case, the trial court already determined that this was a, a mutual mistake as to what the description of the property was. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, I don't put a lot of stock in the fact that, well, we have a recorded deed, and we all, yeah, it's a recorded deed, and the records are down there, you can rely upon that, but if we all know it's wrong and it's not correct, then I, I, don't, I don't buy this argument that we can now rely upon that in good faith when I know in my head it's wrong. It's, a, it's an incorrect legal description or an de incorrect description of the lot which was transferred. But that's not what Carl testified to, and that was not his belief. Carl's belief... Well, I'm not quite interested in what his testimony was or what his belief was because I think the, the, the record you know, the decision or the opinion of the, the district court was contrary to that. I, I understand that, but we're talking about sanctions here. And are you subject to sanctions just because 
your version of events is not accepted by the trial court. No, but you would be subject to sanctions if the trial court found that you knew better and that you were lying and that, that uh, uh, although, although um, you knew what the state of facts were, you were going to dress up some testimony to try and evade your legal obligations. If the court found that, but, that would be sanctionable. But that's not what that's not what the court that's not what the court found. Certainly not what, well, what did they find? Certainly out? not what the court of appeals said. What the court of appeals said is that the sanctionable conduct is the counterclaim and the third party claim. That's on page twenty three of their opinion. So that's where we need to put our focus is what's what's the, what's the, the sanctioned amount for the dismissal of the counterclaim. How much, how much attorney fee time was spent on the encro encroachment issue? If you were to uh, subtract that from the defendant's um, submissions, do you, do you know, or is that something we can figure out? Um, you know, I, I wasn't at the trial, but my, my impression is that the whole, the whole issue of where the buildings were located, that required surveyors, that required surveyors' testimony, I think that that's related to 50% of the entire trial. Much? 50%. What, what about the, the um, lawsuit uh, Phobian filed against the, uh, the land surveyors that caused them to, to retract their corrective affidavit? How do we, what weight do we give that? I, I don't think you can do, give any weight to that. Obviously that occurred well before trial. It, wasn't part of any filing or pleading, and I think is outside the scope of the rule that we're talking about. Um, and the but, other- But let me approach it this way. If, if that had not happened and their, correcti their corrective affidavit had remained part of the, um, you know, the, the court records, would that have uh, streamlined the quiet title litigation and saved a lot of, Legal expenses? No, because the issue that would have been before the court then is what was the coercion that Mr. Iman put on the surveyors to get them to change their survey the first time? Because what Carl did was got them to retract the coerced affidavit that Jerry Iman solicited from them. So this would have been a I don't think much would have changed. You know, I know, if I can ask one more. Uh, you rely on the Rowwater case where we uh, said a $1,000 uh, sanction was enough, but doesn't that, our leeway we give trial courts on an abuse of discretion review work both ways, and here we have a much higher sanction. Shouldn't we give them the same, the trial judge, uh, the same leeway? No, not not when you're dealing with a layman who is who is you know coming who, who didn't come into court voluntarily who was brought into court as a defendant in a lawsuit and who was faced with the Hobson's choice of do I default or do I make them prove their case that's that's where we're at so are you going to sanction somebody because they were sued and chose to defend you know, I think the rules of being a defendant need to be different than the rules for bringing the, the institutor of a claim. And I, I, of course, realize that on the counterclaim, my client was the asserter of that claim. But for the rest of the case, he was the responder. And on that note, um, he didn't assert a counterclaim against the bank, did no. he? No, or, or, or anybody else who requested sanctions. It was just against C.J. Landon. And, and, and yet the, f the fees awarded, did they include uh, the bank's attorney's fees? All of it. Okay. You know, the, the bank had one, one counsel one, who was co-counsel for C.J. Land as well, and all of, those, all of those fees got shifted to Carl. And, how would, and, and are the bills capable of subtracting or allocating that or not? That's really, really tough. And that's not, I don't fault Mr. Roberts for that. It's just when you're in a trial representing two parties, that's the nature of. W wasn't the, uh, the first remand order didn't it direct the, um, the district court to allocate? 
and that didn't happen. Correct. Okay. Um, Mr. Gertis, let me uh, jump in with the question. Sure. Uh, is it your position that Mr. Fobian would have had to have been found to committed perjury before he would be subject to sanctions because his answer was not grounded in fact? No, no. I think you can, I think a litigant is, or an attorney is properly sanctionable if the conduct is appropriately sanctionable without a finding of perjury. I don't think the rule makes any mention of that. To my knowledge, there's no Iowa cases in which perjury was ever charged or alleged to be a prerequisite to a sanction. So no, I don't think that's true. Uh, you, you may sum up. I'm four minutes over, so uh, uh, I think we've addressed uh, all of the issues. I think that the issue of sanctions needs to be reconsidered. At most, what is properly sanctionable is the counterclaim. And um, I think the whole argument that Mr. Fobian made in response to the, to the uh, uh, quiet title and reformation action we can sit back now and look four years later and say you should have done this and you should have done that, but he had a million dollars at stake. And that, to me, is, is, is a legitimate reason to defend someone who wants to reform the mortgage that gave you your collateral. So, thank you, Your Honors. Thank you as well. The case of First American Bank versus Fobian Farms is now then submitted to the court and the bailiff may adjourn. Hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable Supreme Court of the State of Iowa is now adjourned.